Since 30 years, we were hounded up like cattle and chased out from the valley, the same place that for times immemorial has been our own place. We were chased out in the night with ladies, kids crying, but nobody taking a note of that even until now. But we see a ray of light somewhere with eminent personalities like Rajiv Ji, who can at least present to the world that what we as a community has suffered. We see it as a ray of light with the change of governments in India whereby at least Kashmiri community has been recognized as somebody who was displaced. With due permission, uh, Rajiv Malhotra, he is my guru. Uh, before uh, talking about uh, Kashmir issue, I like to address Islamophobia issue in two, three lines. Uh, when a uh, member parliament, Ikra Khaled, tabled uh, um, M103 motion against uh, uh, quote unquote Islamophobia, I wrote her an email and asked her that if there would had been a Islamophobia in Canada, more than 10 member parliamentarians of Muslim origin would have not been elected in Canada. I never got her reply back. <laughs> I understand that with the passage of time, we can see a uh, few uh, streaks of Islamophobia, but that's the kind of uh, business for Islamist organizations. The first person that we really want to thank for coming here um, is someone who needs no introduction at all. You all very much know who he is. Very interesting is his coming here. It kind of proves how karma works. Um, almost a decade ago at the University of Toronto, the Deputy Prime Minister wanted, us, wanted me to speak with Rajiv Malhotra. And for some reason it didn't happen. Um, and thereafter at various events, people say, you know what, someday you and Rajiv Malhotra should speak at the same event. And whatever, it didn't happen. And I think what that shows is that all good things come to those who wait, and the karmic cycle will work in due course. So um, please do give a, a very warm welcome to our karmic guest who needs no introduction, but is a person of extraordinary conviction in what he stands for, um, Rajiv Malhotra. It's a present. It's a Lord Buddha. So, so everyone gets a, a small statue of Lord Buddha that they can, that, that they can uh, keep as a small memento. For those who don't know, Rajiv Malhotra also was involved with uh, Columbia University and he was um, instrumental in, in supporting a project to translate Tibetan Buddhist manuscripts. So everything comes full circle. To begin with, we have our esteemed guest, who has come all the way from US to mark this occasion, Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji. A huge round of applause. As Zenji Neo said, Rajiv ji needs no introduction, and for sure he doesn't need any introduction. Each one of us have heard him. Each one of us know of the work that he has done. With huge, huge, huge round of applause and thankful hearts, I request Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji to please say a few words and share his experiences and thoughts about the topic today. Shri Malhotra. Namaste, Canada. I was told, I was warned that this is a very, uh, you know, big snowstorm coming and do you really want to come and all that kind of stuff. And I'm so delighted I came. No snowstorm would stop me from this important event that we are all celebrating, not only for Kashmiris, but for all Indians, for all Hindus, and all civilized human beings, no matter what their identity. The awareness of this Kashmir Holocaust is nothing compared to so many other events, so many other genocides that we are aware of. I've been to the various Holocaust museums, genocide museums, in Washington, in London, various events. And I must say 
I have not heard of the Kashmir genocide being mentioned. And when you raise it, people wonder what you're talking about. Is it that serious? Is it a big deal? This sort of thing. It's not in textbooks. And guess what? It's not in Indian textbooks either, which is quite a disgrace. I've been to conferences on genocide studies with not a single paper on this topic. Genocide studies by all the liberal people and all the human rights people and I don't see it mentioned. This is quite a, quite a disgrace. It's a pan-Indian issue for sure that all Indians should think about and do their, do their bit to promote this. And we, I started writing on this and I remember in the early days being attacked by Hindus that, look, you are kind of embarrassing us. You are embarrassing us. Because, you know, you come and you start talking about these things. We want to talk about, you know, we are doing IT and we are doing great. We are the great democracy and all that. And you are saying we are facing Hindu phobia. So there is a shame that the victim feels. This is, this is the psychologists know this. Uh, rape victims don't want to go and file a case because they are ashamed of what happened. I think there is a similar shame that might have prevented the Kashmiris from raising hell. They really ought to be raising hell about this. And it's better late than never that this is becoming an international issue. This should be in the newspapers, this should be in the media, this should be in the textbooks, there should be resolutions. You know, there should be resolutions in, in, uh, the, in the US Congress, in, there should be resolutions in the Canadian Parliament to, uh, to recognize this as, a, as an important day. And, and it's not enough for once in a while we meet and we talk about it. We should actually make it into a cause that we are going to have a official recognition of the Kashmir Genocide Day in various governments in the world. <laughs> now, my mother, who's 94 in Delhi, when I told her that I'm coming here, she was so happy. And, and she, when I told her what the cause is, and she wanted me to remi remind all of you that we, the Punjabis, face something similar also. In, in uh, 47, when we had partition, my father had to run away from Lahore. We had lived there for generations, very well settled. It was home, it is home, taken away. You know, two thirds of Punjab went to Pakistan and the very fertile. So it is, Punjab means five rivers and now there's only three Ab left, two of them gone. And even the three that are left, the Indus Water Treaty says the water will go to Punjab, or to Pakistan, much of the water, which is kind of a shame. So the, my father had to run away and uh, many of the family members, many of the extended family friends, they did not make it. So it was a very horrible, so we understand, uh, the Punjabis understand the importance of this. I've started, I started thinking about what are the causes, what are the lessons we can learn from events like, from uh, events like what the Kashmiris faced and what the Punjabis faced. And there is a, of course there are some differences. In the case of Punjab, because the geography is flat land, you cannot run and hide in the mountains. You cannot go into a cave and sort of hide there th that they won't find us. Because you are out there in the open, they are out they're here to kill you. They're on horses, you can't outrun the horses. So either you're going to be killed or you fight back. So the Punjabi was, okay, we are going to fight back. That was a Kshatriyata. The fighter spirit was there, definitely in the, in the Punjabis. And therefore it took, a, it was a buffer, Punjab was a buffer for the onslaught of uh, Islam. To, it took a very long time after conquering Sindh, which was very early. To reach Delhi took hundreds of years because they would just go on resisting, fighting back. And the Islamic invaders would capture territory, then the Punjab armies would take it back. This went on for a very long time. It was not a, probably if you write the history of the Islamic expansion from, you know, the time they enter Punjab, which is the, uh, uh, the Pakistan, uh, border, Pakistan Punjab, Till the time they enter Delhi, which is the other end of Punjab, the number of centuries, hundreds of years that it took, is probably the slowest advancement of Islam anywhere, militarily. 
uh, whenever, wherever it has gone militarily, it's been able to move very fast. So there is a certain kshatriyas are there. Now, unfortunately, what happened is, as Islam colonized, and by the way, we think of colonization under the British, but colonization started under the Muslims. So I, I'll say a lot of uh, politically incorrect things, but I, I have no problem defending these. Uh, Indian colonization started under the Muslims, and then of course the British. So this Islamic colonization, like all colonization, people start accommodating, people start assimilating, accepting little bit, little bit, little bit comes in, each generation become a little more sort of accommodating of what's happening. So this <coughs> created a, an attitude which was that, you know, if you are not being violently attacked, then you know, it's okay. I mean, it could be worse. Life could be worse. So we're lucky that today I'm not being beaten up or something. I'm getting, I have my food and so on. So kind of a minimalist lifestyle, I, I, as long as I'm surviving, I have my do roti and dal, you know, maki roti saag aag mil gaya hai, so I'm okay, this sort of an attitude. And that's really not right. You have to, this is your land, these people are some alien people, not only, we, I'm not concerned about their religion, whatever it is, but they're from some other place. And they have really no business here coming and telling us how to live our lives. It's really no business of this. So this Islamic, Islamic uh, uh, you know, colonization became a, became a, a serious problem. <clears throat> and somewhere along the way, the Kshatriya was compromised. The Kshatriyas, for those of you who don't know, is, the, is not just military people, but political people who know hard power, people who assert hard power. That's the Kshatriyata. The Brahmins uh, are the keepers of the soft power, the knowledge, the poetry, the literature, soft power. We know soft power is very important. But soft power will not survive if you don't have hard power. Once you lose the hard power, then they'll come and take the soft power when they want. You can, this is what happened to the Kashmiri uh, Brahmins, that they lost the hard power. They accepted Muslim ruler over them, which means that the role of the Kshatriya was not a Hindu role anymore. The Kshatriyata was given to the Muslim, and as long as he's not beating us up and all, he's okay only. So there is something I heard uh, called the 50-year golden period in Kashmir in the 1300s. And the golden period is called golden period because the Muslim king at that time was not killing us, beating, raping, and destroying temples. He was okay with us, unlike his father who was doing all those things. So in psychology, it's called the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome means somebody kidnaps you and he beats you up and he's really horrible. But then he starts being a nice guy, gives you, a, you know, good food, talks to you. And so gradually he wins you over and you actually start falling in love with him. You admire him because compared to how it was, it's better. So the standard of expectation is very low. You know, as long, because this guy's father and the previous other Muslims were f much more horrible compared to him. So it's sort of like what happened during Akbar's time also. Uh, Akbar was considered like golden period. Now to me, Hindus can't say we are living in a golden period unless we are ruling ourselves, unless it is ours, our uh, adhikar, our authority, under our shastra, under our, our theories and our lifestyle, un unless we are Run, running a society like that, as long as it's an oppressor who came from another Middle East country, conquered us and uh, ruling over us, no matter how nice he is, I would not call it a golden rule. I may say it's relatively better than uh, other options, but it's not a golden rule, a golden, uh, a golden period. So there, we, there, there was a equilibrium of Brahmins ruled by governed by Muslim rulers. Muslim is in the role of the Kshatriya and the Brahmin in the role of, you know, I'll mind my business, not do anything that is troubling and, uh, you know, won't threaten you and then you look after me. So this sort of, uh, uh, you know, who's the boss and who's sort of operating under the glass ceiling, equilibrium. Now when you have the lesson learnt is that once you have lost the Kshatriyata, it's a matter of time that your 
Brahm, the Brahmins will also be wiped out. And that is what happened. That is what this whole exodus is about because you don't have your own people in charge. So this is, this has happened in many parts of India. It's happened in many parts of the world and there are lessons to be learned. The document, the, the, the Shastra called Arth Shastra is the seminal text or one of the seminal texts on Kshatriyata, on political science, economic theory, statecraft, military craft. And you know, until early 20th century, there was no copy of Arth Shastra to be found in the Indian, in India. No copy. The only reason, the way we knew it, such a thing exists is that it was referenced in other places. Other Shastras referred to the Arth Shastra, but where is this Arth Shastra? Nobody had a copy. And then in Mysore, a copy was found, a whole copy in Sanskrit was discovered only about 100 years ago. So, you know, this means that for some reason, this doctrine was considered like dangerous for us to know. Because if you know Arth Shastra, you know about identity politics, you know about international relationships, you know about political thought, you, you, know, you know how to, how to challenge, how to debate, how to argue, how to talk back. And that's dangerous. So, I don't, historians don't know why exactly Arth Shastra disappeared from India. But it's quite interesting, it's for that thousand year period, that there was no Arth Shastra being taught. Now, you would think that Arth Shastra ought to be a very important part of text today. But even today, when they teach Hindu Dharma, they'll talk about Gita, they'll talk, which is very nice, very important. Uh, there, many, many texts are taught. But hardly any of the Hindu temples and uh, places where you, you, Hinduism is being taught, are they really teaching Arth Shastra because that is the text for Kshatriyas. So you have to revive the Arth Shastra and revive the whole Kshatriya Dharma. It's not just Moksha Dharma that we need to learn but Kshatriya Dharma also. The loss of Kshatriya Dharma will lead to the loss of the rest of the Dharma also. Because when you lose, when you lose hard power, you cannot continue with only soft power. That's a very important point. So now, what needs to be done, many levels, every region of India, is a great civilization, all integrated together into the overall Bharatiya civilization. Each region should have to rediscover and write about its own history, what happened to it, including all the oppression rather than feeling embarrassed and ashamed. You know, there is no uh, history of partition from the Hindu point of view that has been discussed. My mother's generation tells me that when they, uh, they're after partition, they were told, Ki bat, don't talk, you know, like that, it's not good. You know, it's like sort of embarrassing to us. Like the speaker previously said, that it was, it was considered a bit of a humiliation that this is what happened to you. But everybody else is talking about any victimhood they can claim. I mean, Islamophobia is uh, all about claiming victimhood. But come on, I mean, this is more 50 some countries in the world are Islamic countries. Their, their land has been expanding, uh, the population has been expanding. Uh, this, this is thousands of miles away from the point of origin in the Middle East. And this business that we are victims, okay, if there are some instances of victim against the Muslims and it's very wrong. There should be no religious group that is persecuted for their religion. It should be for particular individual acts that somebody does, but not because of their religion. So if, if, if this business of, uh, you know, claiming victimhood is so much in vogue and it, it works, it gets you mileage, uh, it gets you, you know, special commemorative days and stamp, postage stamps and holidays and all, all kind of recognition, then Hindus have to claim Hindu phobia and talk about Hindu phobia in a very open way and we have to teach our children there's nothing embarrassing and odd, we are the victims, they are the ones who, the ones who are the oppressors are the ones who should feel embarrassed and not us. We should be talking like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, what has happened is the other way around. In India, there is something called subaltern studies, which is brought in by the Marxists to teach the Indian communities that their problem is caused by the Vedic heritage. So instead of us being the victims of all of this that has happened, 
we are being portrayed as the perpetrators. We are the guys causing all this problem for other people. And that is called subaltern studies. The word subaltern means people who don't have a voice. They don't have a voice in history. So the history was written without their point of view. And we the scholars are going to be their voice. We the scholars. That's sort of what subaltern history. But if you really think about it, we the Hindus are the subalterns because our view and our, rep our vision and our experience is not mentioned in history. It is not in the museums. If you go around all these museums where they talk about these things, our holocausts and our uh, you know, genocides are not included there. So in a sense, we are the subaltern people and we ought to speak up like that we are the victims. Now it's uh, the, the issue also takes us to ideology and discourse. By the time hate speech codified in a holy book or some discourse, by the time that hate speech turns into physical violence, it's too late. But unfortunately, while the security systems in the world are on alert and very good, getting better all the time to fight the physical violence, if you start arguing and deconstructing the intellectual discourse which leads to this physical violence, you'd be called all kinds of things. You'd, it was very politically incorrect to say that. But the fact is, if you really want to get behind and anticipate, if you want to get behind the violence, anticipate what is being taught which is creating the violence, you have to go and examine the sacred texts, religious texts and look at it. In about uh, the late 90s, my foundation got a grant proposal from Cornell University uh, Religious Studies Department that uh, they want to conduct a, a world, uh, you know, world religions conference and all, the Dalai Lama will come and all the main leaders of various religions will come uh, and they will talk about uh, uh, the persecution of uh, religious communities. So I was asked to fund it. I said, okay, great, let's fund it. Let's sit down and develop a, a concept paper. So everyone's idea was to uh, talk about how they are the victims. Every, all these different religious groups had position papers on how they are victims. Some place they are victim here, there. So I said, but who, what about the perpetrators? So if you are the victim, he's the perpetrator. If he's the victim, that's the perpetrator. So part of your religion is the victim, but another part of your religion is also the perpetrator. So we should talk about, when we are talking, all of the religions getting together, they were going to issue a resolution that we are all kind of uh, nice guys and everybody hating us and all that. But actually, they, they ought to also acknowledge that some of those religions are very aggressive. So what I told this uh, uh, professor is that, look, you still have two years for this event to happen. So I want to fund something before the conference. I want you to pick a graduate student in religious studies from one from every major religion. And this group will get one year grant to look through the main holy text of each faith. And they will highlight all the hate speech against other people. So you can do it for my faith too. If, you, if there's any uh, hatred against non-Hindus in the Gita, you will highlight that. But whatever it says in the Old Testament, New Testament, Quran, you will highlight it. And then what we'll do is we'll make a list of uh, all the texts, verse number and all that, which is hate speech. And part of this resolution which these religious leaders are going to pass should say that for my, in my faith, whatever is highlighted in, the relig in my religious text, I will deactivate it. I will not teach that anymore. <laughs> Professor Jane Mary Law, that was her name, I just recalled. He was the chair of religious studies at Cornell, was very impressed. She said, you know, this will make it interesting, unique. 
conference. We'll actually take, it, take him to task. So she wrote me a nice message to that effect. I said, okay, great, so let's prepare the papers, we'll do the funding. Then I didn't hear anything from her. <laughs> so then I wonder what's going on. So I called and she's busy. So then I finally visited, I took the car and drove to Ithaca and asked her, I said, oh, Jane, what happened? She says, you know, I'm in real serious trouble. Oh, I sent your proposal. Only the Hindu said he'll agree with this. <laughs> the Jewish person, the Christian person, and especially the Muslim person said, how dare you tell us what to deactivate in our text? How dare you tell us? Now these guys all want to meet and, to, and come up with a big resolution about religious violence. Huh? Oh, we are, we, we are a victim and all that. But if you tell him that this is what's in your text and this is what's in your text, I will do the same for my text also. Whatever you find which is hate speech towards non-Hindus, I will deactivate it. Okay. I didn't even say expunge it and delete it. Because I know that uh, uh, God told them never to do that. <laughs> but I only said the person has to merely pass in the resolution he has to say, I will not teach. And my people, I will tell them not to teach these things, which means they can remain, but we won't teach them. They're not willing to do that. So this is the hypocrisy of the interfaith movement. The whole interfaith movement has a hypocrisy. <laughs> and I'm particularly addressing certain people I won't name, who love these interfaith meetings because it gives them some prestige and pride they can represent. And they keep getting invited because they will not say anything politically incorrect. It is all this, we love each other, everybody is one, we are all the same. So you, you say all these goody goody things because the sponsors who are guilty, people who want to write checks and feel they're doing good, they'll say, yeah, yeah, I'm funding this and next year he'll fund more. So you are, you are in business, this is your business funding. However, after passing this resolution that we are all brothers and same this and that, the point is the guy will go and give his speech on the Friday seminar thing or the Saturday or the Sunday in his, in his uh, faith and uh, there he'll go and trash all these uh, infidels and kafirs and all these kind of people. So it is hypocrisy. I mean, if you feel, I mean, it's like uh, we have this Diwali celebration in a friend's house in Princeton and every year they uh, some, some people singing things and one of the fav favorite songs is Ishwara Allah Tere Naam <laughs> which means Ishwar and Allah are all same, you know. So I told them that uh, if Ishwar is same as Allah, then Allah should be same as Ishwar, it has to be both, both ways. So I said, you know, what we should do is go to a mosque, any mosque and see if you can say it. <laughs> and all these uh, the, that, you know, Krishna is same as Jesus fashion nowadays and uh, Mary is like goddess only, something like that. I told, I made a challenge for 25 years I've been making this challenge that you find me any mainstream church in any metropolitan city in the United States where they are willing to have me install the deities, Hindu deities in their church and I will find you a Hindu temple where we'll install Jesus as a deity, Good, provided it is both ways. And I want, to, I want to properly install the Hindu deity, including Kali also. And they're very scared, Kali, oh. <laughs> there is no such quid pro quo. So if you are same, it doesn't mean I have to be like you, it also means that you should be like me. If we are same, if X equals Y, then Y equals X, you learn that in school. So this business of sameness is sort of this all confusion, muddled up, hypocrisy, all this kind of thing goes on. We have to think of helping those Muslims who are truly liberal, truly interested in reformation. Because after all, you know, Christianity was also pretty much like that. The, the bishops had police powers. They had fatwa type powers, these bishops at one time. And in Europe, the reformation took about 200 years of violence inside inside the Christian uh, countries between different camps and what not and this reformation was not some overnight job. It took a very long time and a lot of sacrifice and Islam is sort of like 
pre-reformation Christianity. So it is at some point in time, Islam has to be reformed and the only people who can do it are the Muslims themselves in their own best interest because they want all the goodies of the West, they want modernity, their kids want to live a certain lifestyle. You know, Islamic civilization is not able to and will not be able to produce this kind of R&D and free thinking unless they change their, you know. So, the, in the interest of Muslims themselves, they have to have a reformation and we ought to work together with those who are of that kind of orientation and facilitate that. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for uh, Muslims who are themselves suffering because when, when radical Islam comes, the first people they go after are the Muslims themselves. And I have coined a term Swadeshi Muslim, which means uh, those Muslims of India who say that this is my home, this is my homeland, my ancestors are from here, they are not Arabs or Iranians or Turkish people who came from somewhere else. Uh, my DNA, my culture, my, my, my forefathers were Hindus and I am proud of it. I practice Islam, but I, I am proud of my ancestors also and I have nothing, why should I be violent against them? You, if you admit who your parents are, you, you tendency is not to go violent against them. That is human nature. It is only through the denial, which is fake, which is uh, you know falsified kind of denial. Only if you can convince people to deny their ancestry, can you get them to be violent against those very cultures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here and also hit the bell icon to make sure you get notified. To donate, please click this button.